In the last video, I showed you how I collected and isolated fungi from some seagrass and performed DNA extraction and PCR on it so that we can DNA barcode the organism and get a proper ID. In this video, we'll continue where we left off by reviewing how to order sequencing online, how to prepare and ship the sample to the lab, and finally, how to review and interpret your sequencing results. Let's dive in. To start, I think it would be helpful to gain a brief understanding of the sequencing technology widely used in DNA barcoding. It's called Sanger Sequencing, and it's named after its creator, Frederick Sanger, who developed the technology with his team in 1977. At a high level, Sanger Sequencing works by incrementally producing fragments of DNA from the template DNA, or in our case, what's being barcoded, and terminating those fragments with a terminating nucleotide that is either radioactively or fluorescently labeled. These fragments are then put through a special machine that performs a form of electrophoresis that can separate out all of those specially labeled fragments and can read them in order using UV light. The main point I want to drive home here is that reading light wavelengths and intensity is a key concept in Sanger sequencing, and it'll explain the format and variability we see in our sequencing results. Let's talk about ordering your sequencing services. There's really two places you can go to. One is MC Lab, which if you look here, you can check out their DNA sequencing services. And you'll notice that the pricing is really just great. I think this is probably the lowest price you can get on a per sample basis. $349 for a regular PCR reaction product and another dollar for PCR cleanup, which you will need. But the one criticism I have of MC Lab is that their ordering process is unnecessarily difficult, especially if you're a newbie. It involves downloading this Excel order form and filling it out. And there's just a bunch of fields in that form that don't really make a lot of sense if you're new. Also, it's 2021. Where's the web-based order form? Anyways, they're great. I just wouldn't recommend them for newbies. The other option though is GeneWiz, and that's what we're gonna be using in this example. GeneWiz is a little bit more expensive, but the technical support that you get is really worth it, uh, especially if you're new and you're just getting started and you have lots of questions like I did when I first started. So let's start by going through the process of setting up a new GeneWiz account. So you'll just click on the login and then sign up now. And there's really not a lot of information on this form. Uh, just your typical login information, your address, and a couple of terms of service boxes that you need to select. I don't recall there being any account approval process as there is for many other biotech companies. Having used them for several months now, I can attest to their being independent researcher friendly and not requiring that you be affiliated with any organizations or being incorporated as a business. So once we log in, we're going to be shown the main uh, dashboard here, which includes all the information for ordering at the top and then your prior orders at the bottom, which you can see my order history and all the other DNA barcoding batches. But we're gonna do the Sanger sequencing ordering. So we're gonna click on Sanger sequencing and we are gonna be sequencing a PCR product, an unpurified one, because we have not purified our product and we'll be taken to this order screen here. Before we move on, I wanna show you how I track my uh, DNA barcoding samples. Because if you're doing a lot of them and you're doing multiple orders, you will want to have some sort of centralized way of tracking them. So I've created this Google Sheet here and whenever I have a culture, I will come in and put in a new entry into this spreadsheet. You can see that I have one already with the date that I cultured it a user-friendly name that you'll see I use in the order form, a batch number that I call the Everyman Bio ID. This is batch seven, the first sample. And it's also where I'll track the species name, the links to the observations that I've made, when I've added it to my library, the primers that I used, the type of sequencing read that I did, the vendor, the information about the read results, and basically just all of the metadata associated with my samples. Um, I find that's, this to be really, really helpful. So if we go back to the order form, you'll see that the upper left-hand field, and we'll just go through each one here, the DNA type is a PCR product, it's unpurified. Service type, we cannot change. Service priority is just standard unless you wanted to do it the same day. We also need to upload the gel image from the PCR reaction, and we'll come back to why we need to do this later. 
Next, we'll need to enter in the number of samples that we will be ordering. So just one for the seagrass. We'll enter in an order name. Now, I like to name these and have them correspond with my barcoding tracker. So here, I'll name it fungi DNA barcoding-7 to indicate the seventh batch. And the seagrass will be the one and only sample. If there's anything special you did in the PCR reaction that you want the lab to know about, you can enter it in, into the comments. And then note that there's a promotion and coupon code. If you are a new customer, generally you'll get a new customer discount. So look into that. If we look at the sample submission guidelines and go through their little wizard here, select unpurified product, select your primer. This is going to give us information about what we need to submit to them. We need to send 10 microliters of the undiluted PCR product as well as a primer, depending on the type of sequencing. If we're going to be doing a forward read, then we will send in some forward primer. If we're going to do reverse read, the reverse primer, or both if we're going to read in both directions. In this case, we're just going to do one. And it says there that the gel image is there to help them estimate the DNA concentration and they do that by looking at the band in the image. It also shows how to label it. So in our case, we're going to be putting JM01. JM, which is my initials, and then 01 to denote the sample number. We're going to be writing that on the tube. But isn't it nice how everything just kind of lines up? Okay, so now we need to enter in a DNA name. I'm putting in seagrass mold. The length, which we know from running the gel, is between 500 and 1,000 base pairs. And then we need to select the primer. We're going to do a forward read, so we're going to select the ITS-1F primer. The primer, by the way, uh, when I ordered it from GeneWiz, there was an option to pay a little extra and have them keep some on file so that I don't have to send any in. So that's why when I order, I can come and check this stored at GeneWiz button because they actually have some of my primer on file. It just saves me a step for when I want to sequence. So I'll click Save and Review, and now we can see the total price for our order. It's $6 per sample, and then we need to have them do a cleanup of the PCR product that we did in the first video, and that's an additional $3, so $9 per sample here. Further down the page, we can just confirm that we will be submitting one tube labeled JM1 and it corresponds with the seagrass mold that we are going to DNA barcode. We'll then click on add to cart and now we complete the order in the checkout screen which starts by choosing how we want to ship the samples to GeneWiz. There's a lot of options. You can drop them off in certain areas. In this case we're going to be overnighting them with FedEx. We'll also need to choose how we're going to pay. In this case I like to pay with a credit card. We'll select the billing address, select the terms of service, and then check out. Now, once you check out, you will be uh, prompted to print out this order confirmation sheet that you will need to include alongside your sample when you mail it in. And that's what allows their internal team to track the order as it goes through the sequencing process. And now that we've placed our sequencing order and we've already run the PCR reaction for the DNA barcoding process, we're now going to be preparing to send our PCR product to the lab for sequencing. And we'll do that by taking an empty tube, as you see here, and labeling it JM1 per the submission guidelines. Note that I didn't capture it, but 10 microliters of the PCR product has already been added to the tube. Once the tube is labeled, I'm now going to wrap the tube in some parafilm and this is to help prevent the lid from popping open during transport. You could use tape if you don't have any parafilm. And then I like to drop it into a padded envelope that will then go inside of the FedEx overnight envelope. If you do decide to do sequencing through GeneWiz, you can reach out to a GeneWiz account representative and get the FedEx account number so that when you want to overnight a uh, PCR reaction for sequencing, you can bill the overnight shipping charges to the GeneWiz billing account. So here I'm just preparing the FedEx package by putting that padded envelope along with the printed tracking page like inside of it. 
and the next step will be to journey to the FedEx here. facility and drop this off. I got time, it's clear to see From up here, the world seems small We can sit together it's so beautiful. You and me. After anxiously waiting 24 to 48 hours, your samples will arrive at the lab, be checked in, and you will receive an email such as this one letting you know that your sample has arrived and that you can monitor the progress by logging into your GeneWiz account. And after logging into our account and clicking on View Results, we'll be taken to the Sequencing Results page for the order where we can see the reaction, the sample, and a couple of other pieces of information such as the quality score, anything over 40 is considered good or passing, and the contiguous read length, which is the length of the sequence read, we got 585 here, as well as the various uh, sequencing files that we'll be using to analyze our sequence. We start off with the sequence file, the trace file, and then finally the FRED file, which we will download. And that takes us to the next segment, which is analyzing the sequence results. So let's open up each file and quickly go through them. The first one is the .seq or sequence file. It's also known as a FASTA file. You'll see the greater than sign with a sequence name and then the sequence itself below that. One thing I'd like you to notice is that the letter N is repeated at the beginning and the end of the sequence. And this means that the sequencing software was unable to identify the base. And that can occur for many reasons, which we won't get into. Just know that with Sanger sequencing, you'll usually need to trim these regions off from the sequence before comparing them. It is possible to have ends in the middle of the sequence, and we can look at the underlying signal data in the chromatogram we downloaded to see if it's possible to discern the correct base and edit the sequence accordingly. So the next file we're going to look at here is called a FRED file, and it contains all of the bases along with the peak height and a FRED quality score. If you remember, we talked about what Sanger sequencing is. It uses light to measure the amplitude of specific wavelengths, and so these numbers correspond to the strength and quality of those red wavelengths for that particular base. And it's the peak and quality of those wavelengths that allows the software to make accurate calls about what the bases are in the sequence. But there's an even better way that we can look at this data and do further analysis, and that's by using the free Snap Gene Viewer to open the AB1 file. And that will give us a visual representation, um, also called a chromatogram, of the information that the sequencing machine read, including the amplitude and quality score for each base that was read. So let's take a quick tour of this chromatogram in the SnapGene software. We'll see in the title, it says there were 609 bases. And if we click on chromatogram data, we'll see what looks like the FASTA format, which is the raw sequencing bases. There's a couple of handlebars that you can use to zoom in or just make the graph a little bit more readable. And if we click on a base, we'll show the corresponding peak height and quality score and what we're looking for are nice, clean, narrow, tall peaks. And so here's a good example where the software was unable to determine one of the bases. And so if we look closely, we'll see a nice, clean uh, adenosine base. But there is a thymine base tucked down between that A and C. So if we select the N and type in T, we can go ahead and add that T to the sequence. After you've annotated any of the ambiguous bases you can, go ahead and trim off the ends of the sequence, typically starting off with the innermost end value, highlighting the end section, and hitting delete. Once this is done, the underlying sequence data will be updated, and we'll be able to go ahead and start using the BLAST tool to see if our sequence matches any species of known type in GenBank. Let's pause here for a moment and reflect on all the work that we've done to get to this point. We've isolated some wild fungi from a piece of seagrass. We've extracted and amplified the ITS region of its DNA. And now we actually have the barcoding sequence in hand. This is the part to me that I find most exciting. It's where we finally get to identify the organism that we've grown close to. So let's go ahead and take that sequence and 
begin to search GenBank and see if we can figure out what exactly this marine based fungi is. All right, let's start the fun part. Once we've made an initial first pass at cleaning things up, we can select the sequence, go to tools in the menu and select blast. This will post the selected sequence to the blast tool on the GenBank website. And we can start by limiting our search results to comparing our sequence with only sequences that came from known type material. Type materials are basically reference species that are assured to have correct IDs and related sequences in the database. It's quite easy to mislabel or misassociate sequences with the wrong species. And so whenever possible, it's best to try and use type material results to determine an ID. However, as you'll see, there are often aren't very many results that have a type sequence. So you often have no choice but to fall back on non-typed sequences. So after we hit blast, our sequence is going to be compared against all of the other known sequences in GenBank and a listing of results will be presented. Drum roll. And now we have the results. And look at that. It looks like our sequence matches closely to Alternaria species. So we know that our seagrass fungi is some form of Alternaria. Now we can sort by a lot of different fields, but I like to sort by this percent identical. And we'll see that with type species, the number one match is 99.82% similar to our sequence, and that's for Alternaria californica. But there are some other Alternaria species um, that match closely. So we need to dig, dig into this a little bit more. If we click on the alignments tab, we'll actually be able to see our sequence in alignment with the closest matches so that we can see the individual nucleotide differences. If we look at this very first one, we'll see that uh, 560 of our bases match against 561 of the top results. That means there's one nucleotide difference between the two. And if we look a little closer, we'll see that here we're missing a, a, a where the top match has an additional A. So what we can do is we can open our chromatogram. We'll copy this little section here so we can find it easily. We just do control F and paste that series of bases in there. And we see GTGA, whereas the top matching result has GTGAA. And so if you look, you'll see this peak is a little bit wider than some of the other peaks. And that can happen with Singer sequencing where there's repeating nucleotides. Sometimes it'll show up as a single, a single wide peak as, a, as opposed to individual distinct peaks. So we keep going down and repeating this process for each of the results, looking for those individual nucleotide differences and then referring back to the chromatogram to see if there are additional edits and annotations that we need to make in our underlying sequence. So here's another one. Again, I'll copy the leading sequence so I can find it in our chromatogram. And we have a TTTG here, whereas on this particular one, they have a C where we have a T. But if we look at our chromatogram, we could see that there's clearly a T where they have a C. So there's no edit to be made there. That's a, a legitimate mutation or difference. Again, we are just going through each listing and comparing those individual nucleotide differences to make sure that there's no additional annotations. So here's one where we have a C, they have an A. And you can see that that's clearly a C right there, CCA, and they have a CAA. So here's another example where this match has an additional T. And if we look th at that in our chromatogram, we'll see that there is no additional T in ours. So we're just going to leave our sequence alone. So that's good. And so after making all of the annotations using type material, I like to re-blast 
the updated sequence with the type material search turned off so that we can now look at all of the other sequences and see how our sequence compares against all of the sequences in GenBank. And with the updated search results, if you look on the percent identical column, there's actually some 100% ones in there. That means our sequence matches 100% another listing. But there's multiple, uh, multiple 100% matches. And if you look at the species name in the description or scientific name, they match with Alternaria alternata, Alternaria ventricosa, um, some individual isolates. And so this is where it can be a little bit difficult to know exactly what the species is because there's obviously, um, this is kind of what I was mentioning before, there are a lot of species that are not type material species that, are, that may be mislabeled. And Alternaria actually happens to be one of those species that uh, is best served using multiple barcoding sequences, not necessarily just the ITS, which is what we used. Uh, there are other primers that you can use to amplify uh, different or larger regions of the DNA in the organism. And that's what's actually used to get uh, to pin down a proper ID for this organism. But what you're seeing here is just me repeating that process of sorting by the highest percentage matches, going to the alignment tab, and then making those individual, uh, or checking rather, the individual nucleotide differences and making sure that there's no additional tweaks that are showing up in our chromatogram that we need to make. And then every time I make an update in the sequence, I re-blast it so I can get uh, continually get updated results. And after repeating this process multiple times, we'll see that there are now many 100% identical results. And if you look at the scientific name for them, most of the matches are coming up matching with Alternaria infectoria, which is kind of interesting because if you then go and paste that name into a search engine, you can learn all about that particular species. You'll see that it's actually a pathogen for humans, but that it also is an endophyte and a common plant pathogen, which sort of matches up with the fact that I found this particular species nestled within the roots of a seagrass. And with that, we can conclude this video by definitively identifying the seagrass mold as being of the genus Alternaria, with a high likelihood of being Alternaria infectoria. With a little bit more research, perhaps an additional go-round with a different primer, or verification from a trained mycologist that studies this species, we can gain more certainty and shift our focus towards publishing the observation back to the community for future scientists that may encounter the same organism. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.